It's day three of the Dracula countdown, and today's Dracula found fame as one of the best heavies in Hollywood's Old West. Born in 1919 in Latimer Mines, Pennsylvania, Volodymyr Polanyik was the son of a Ukrainian-American coal miner. He was one of six children and spent his early adulthood working in the mines before a football scholarship took him away to the University of North Carolina. He would later drop out of the program to pursue a career as a professional boxer under the name Jack Brazo and would go on to win his first 15 matches, 12 by knockout, before losing to Joe Boxy in 1940. That fight caused him to rethink his boxing career, as decades later he would tell a Los Angeles Times reporter that it made him think, you must be nuts to get your head beat in for $200. With the entrance of the United States into World War II, the now-named Jack Polanyik, would join the United States Army Air Forces. He piloted a B-24 Liberator and, after a catastrophic crash that left him severely burned and injured, he received a Purple Heart, Good Conduct Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. Later reports would claim that his distinctive look was the result of both scarring from the burns and plastic surgery to reconstruct his face, although he himself would deny this saying that the story had been concocted by a PR flack for the studio. Following his honorable discharge in 1944, Jack returned to the States and began studying journalism at Stanford University, along the way changing his last name to Palance. He worked as a sports writer for the San Francisco Times, in addition to more typical college student jobs, such as short order cook and lifeguard. But once Palance discovered acting, he dropped out of university once again to pursue his new career. He debuted on Broadway in 1947, playing a Russian soldier in The Big Two, which would lead to being signed as Marlon Brando's understudy in the Broadway production of A Streetcar Named Desire. While he would be passed over for the role in the subsequent national tour, he would make his film debut three years later in Panic in the Streets, directed by the same director as Broadway's Streetcar, Elia Kazan. By his third role, Palance had climbed to second billing and earned his first Oscar nomination for his role as a coal miner in Sudden Fear. The following year, he would be nominated for the role of Jack Wilson in Shane, which rocketed him to national attention. Palance would work steadily for decades, bouncing between American and European productions, usually playing villains with the occasional blue-collar or detective role. His career ticked steadily along, and in the 80s, he would burst back into stardom following a regular hosting gig on the revitalized Ripley's Believe It or Not. Palance parlayed the opportunity into more high-visibility roles, culminating in his casting as Curly in the 1991 comedy City Slickers, the role that finally won him his first-ever Oscar. Famously, during his acceptance, Palance decided to prove that he was still vital and capable by performing one-armed push-ups on the award show stage. Palance continued to work steadily for the rest of his life, taking on roles in both mainstream Hollywood productions and in lower-budget B-movie fare. He also performed guest vocals on several albums, painted landscape art, and published a book of poetry, and co-founded the Hollywood Trident Foundation, for American actors concerned about Ukrainian affairs. At one point, Palance turned down an offer to be awarded the title of People's Artist by Vladimir Putin. He performed on camera for the final time in 2004's Back When We Were Grown Ups with Blythe Danner. What properties do you have that will interest me? Actually, quite a few. I have some photographs in my yes, luggage. I must see them. As soon as I've unpacked, I'll... Now. Yes, of course. 
Born in 1927 in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Syracuse University graduate and former syndicated television series salesman Dan Curtis found himself suddenly thrust into the national spotlight following the success of his afternoon soap opera, Dark Shadows. Through the 60s and 70s, Curtis would remain a fixture in the horror genre, primarily working in television on miniseries and made-for-TV movies, including The Night Stalker, the inspiration for the later cult TV series, Coal Shack, The Night Stalker. From 1968 to 1974, he directed a series of classic horror adaptations, with Jack Palance starring in the first installment, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and in the penultimate installment, Bram Stoker's Dracula. The Dan Curtis production of Dracula featured a screenplay by I Am Legend scribe and frequent Twilight Zone contributor Richard Matheson. It was produced on location in Romania and England and intended for broadcast on British television and on the CBS network in the United States. The production is part of a long tradition in Dracula adaptations of borrowing elements from previous adaptations that were not part of the source material, while also providing new material that would later be plundered by other adaptations. In this case, the sad fate of Jonathan Harker can be traced not to the original novel, but to Hammer Films' adaptation. While Dracula's pursuit of his reincarnated love makes its first appearance in the lore in this exact movie, only to later be used by Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. Also, Matheson's script may be the first such production to explicitly state that Dracula is, in fact, the same person as the historical basis of the original character, Vlad Tepish. It appears that there was actually a moment here that Palance could easily have become the 1970s and 80s answer to Bela Lugosi. His earlier appearance in Curtis's adaptation of Jekyll and Hyde had caught the eye of the artists behind Marvel Comics' The Tomb of Dracula, who had based their own version of the vampire count on Palance's signature look three years before this production. And Palance would later say that he had turned down offers from multiple studios and directors to reprise the role. Some of that might be because of Palance's claim that he had delved so deep into the character as a method actor that he found himself in his personal life becoming Dracula in ways that he didn't like. And some of it may be that it feels like an awful lot of his character may have been left on the cutting room floor. What we see of Palance's Dracula when he gets the opportunity to speak is interesting. He's charming, but not in the seductive or noble mode that we've seen other actors play him. Rather, he's charming in a brusque, veteran's manner. He is a man who is used to being in command, and a man who is always strategically plotting. He's prone to bouts of extreme anger when he sees himself being challenged, but prefers to operate with a smile masking his underlying menace. But we don't get to see much of that side of Palance's Dracula. Instead, most of his on-screen time seems to be spent wordlessly snarling and growling at the camera, emphasizing the idea that Dracula is, above all else, a vicious animal who feeds on human beings. A lot of what Palance establishes in the opening scenes, and that he returns to briefly at the end of the movie, just doesn't seem to be present for most of the film, which can leave it feeling as though Palance was genuinely acting for a movie that was very different from what ultimately made it to the screen. Mr. Harker. Now I go to England. And you? Hey! In 1973, Dan Curtis's Dracula was supposed to air for the first time under the title Bram Stoker's Dracula. However, the film's initial telecast wound up preempted by the news of Richard Nixon's resignation. It would be rebroadcast in 1974, where it would gain critical praise for both Curtis's production and specifically for Palance's performance. Later video releases would carry the title Bram Stoker's Dracula until the early 90s, 
when Columbia Pictures would purchase the rights to the title, yes, just to the title itself, for their upcoming Francis Ford Coppola production. Curtis's production would thereafter be referred to as Dan Curtis's Dracula. Meanwhile, in 1991, Dan Curtis would attempt to relaunch his hit series Dark Shadows with a new, younger cast. But the attempt would be stymied as many of the early episodes would be preempted, this time with news about Desert Storm. What do you think of Jack Palance's performance as Dracula? A lot of people actually list this Dracula as one of their favorites. Do you agree? Do you disagree? That's what the comments are there for. Let's start a discussion about this. And while you're down there, why not take a moment to click on like and subscribe, hit the bell to get notifications about every time the Film Optimist posts a new video, and hey, why not share this video with a friend who might appreciate the subject matter? Until next time, I am Glenn Williams, the Film Optimist, reminding you to watch like it means something.